I'm excited because today I get the honor and the privilege of launching a brand new sermon series. The last sermon series of 2023 entitled Timing. And I just have a sneaky suspicion based on the way sermon prep was going that this series is going to be awesome. I know, I know I said that with Planted. I know I said that with Trap House. I know I said that with Love Is and Voices, but y'all see I wasn't lying. <laughs> and I just believe the same way that God did it before is the same way that God is going to do it again. This last series is going to be absolutely awesome, but more than the awesome biblical wisdom that you and I can glean on for the next several weeks, my prayer is truly, I pray that God uses this series to add sobriety so that we could understand that two of the greatest commodities that you and I have that has future implications, two of the greatest attributes that has future impacts, meaning these two things, they're going to impact your tomorrow. Two of the greatest commodities that you and I have is our time and our decisions. Decisions and time. Time and decisions. For what you do with your time is because it has affected your decisions. And what you do with your decisions by default will affect your time. Time and decisions. Time and decisions. This is why procrastination is so dangerous. Because procrastination is based on the assumption that the opportunity will still be there on tomorrow. I didn't say that one more time. Two of the greatest commodities that you and I have is our time and our decisions. This is why procrastination is so dangerous because procrastination is based on the assumption that you'll still have the opportunity on tomorrow. And you may not because some instructions are time sensitive. And you do not know how critical your swift obedience is. Time and decisions. Time and decisions. Procrastination and wasting time prolongs a harvest that is tied to a regiment that you keep saying, I'll do later. Did y'all hear? I have to teach this. Did y'all hear what I just said? Wasting time postpones a harvest that's tied to a regiment or instructions that you keep saying, I'll do later. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it when I get to it. I'll make time for it. I'll get to it one day. Time and decisions. Time and decisions. Maybe this is why. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, Today, if you hear my voice. Somebody say today. today. It doesn't say next week. It doesn't say when you feel like it. It doesn't say when I feel as though the breakup will be easier. It doesn't say January 1st of 2024. It says today, right now, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart the way you did in rebellion. Somebody say time. time. Now say decisions. decisions. Time and decisions is so critical that depending on what you decide to do in your lifetime will affect your afterlife placement. Whatever you decide to do in your lifetime will affect your afterlife placement. I want to speak around this thought from this subject for a few moments for part one of our brand new sermon series, It's About Time. It's about time. It's about time. Could you find two people? This is the last time I'm going to have you do it. Could you find two people and tell them it's about time? It's about time. It's about time. It's... Ooh. Some of y'all don't even recognize that you are being prophetic. God is like, okay, I just used you because I've been trying to get them to get that too. It's about time. It's about time for you to start praying. It's about time. It's about time for you to increase your devotion time. It's about time. It's about time for you to start seeking my face. It's about time. It's about time for you to forgive them. Let the grudge go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. That doesn't mean that you have to have them re-enter your life, but it does mean you have to release the offense. 
Let it go. Let it go. All bitterness does is contaminate the container. It's about time you forgive. It's about time you start trusting me. It's about time you break up. It's about time you trust my timing. It's about time you keep your legs closed. It's about time you keep your zipper up. I'm not sorry. My generation requires real. It's about time that you stop smoking weed and getting high. It's about time that you stop going to the hookah bar. That's not legalism. That's temple care awareness. It's me being aware that my body is a temple. And it was not made for fornication. It was not made for adultery. It was not made for Hennessy. It was not made for me to be intoxicated. But it was made for me to house the Holy Spirit. It was made for me to be God's transportation system throughout the earth. It's about time. It's about time. It's about time you start honoring your spouse. It's about time you stop talking to your wife like that. It's about time you stop talking to your husband like that. It's about time you unlearn your type. I came out swinging. It's about time you unlearn your type because I don't know, maybe it was just me, but I don't have time. And I cannot afford to form any more wrong bonds with wrong souls. Anybody else? Like, I, I don't have time to waste time on wrong people. It's, it's about time. I've heard many sermons about guarding your heart. And that's great. You should. That's Bible. I've heard many sermons about protecting your peace. That's great. You should do that. That's biblical. But I have not heard enough sermons about protecting your time. Hmm. Protecting your time because time is for a limited time only. It's about time. It's about time. Well, I I'll get to it later. Perhaps the issue is not that we lack time but rather we lack stewardship with our time. It's about time. It's about time for you to grow up. It's about time for you to spiritually mature. Enough with spiritual diapers where you're making a mess and you're sitting in it and expecting somebody else to clean you up and you blame them. Blaming is not healing. Blaming is not fertilizer for your healing, but rather it is the umbilical cord for your bitterness. It's about time. It's about time. How you spend your time is how you'll spend your life. So watch this. To waste time is to waste life. It's about time. It's about time. It's about time. Time is greater than money. Money's time. No, it's not. Time is money. No, it's not. You can make more money, but you can't make more time. Can I keep going? Yeah. Time is currency. This is why you have to be careful what you're paying attention to. Because whatever has your focus, you are paying. Whatever has your focus, you are paying. You are paying with your time. And see, I'm like, okay, for the love of God, if you're going to focus on something and pay for it, at least focus on something that pays you back. Is it just me? Like, at least focus on something that pays you back with wisdom, that pays you back with peace. That pays you back with joy. I know that your Netflix subscription, your Hulu, whatever it may be, is $19.99 a month. But there's another charge in there that's a hidden fee that you don't see. It's the cost of your time. Time, time. Time is currency. It's not expensive. It's priceless. Did y'all hear what I just said? It's not just expensive, it is priceless. Time, time. Can I help us? Y'all didn't say nothing. Left side, can I help us? Okay, see, we, we have to remember because many of us are frustrated with God because we feel as though he's taking his time. 
but we forgot that God created time but doesn't live in it. <laughs> it hits you, I know. <laughs> God created time, put man in time, but he doesn't live in time. He lives in eternity. So God looks at our life and sees the beginning and the end already. This is why we call him the Alpha and the Omega. So it's not that God is taking his time. It's you're providing, you're providing God with a deadline on when you expect for him to do what you want him to do in your time. But he's outside of time. You have to be careful when you're praying to God about time because he doesn't live in it. He's not restricted by it. He's not held by it. We are. He's outside of time. We're in time. Can we go a little deeper? I, I want us to see these foundational text. I could not compact or compartmentalize these in just one. So we have three foundational texts that, that are better going to corroborate my claim. I want for us to see this. Exodus chapter 9, verse 5. One verse. It says, and the Lord appointed a set, what's that word? Time. Saying, tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. Put a mental bookmark on appointed. Now, Ecclesiastics chapter 3, verse 1, it says, There is, what's that word? A time for some things. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. See, a part of biblical intelligence is when you understand that time is in measurements, but seasons are in manifestations. You measure time, months, weeks, that's measurements. Seasons are manifestations. It's easier for you to recognize the seasons because it's manifested in the atmosphere. You can recognize we're in the season of fall because leaves are falling and the wind is getting a little more brisk. So it's not hard necessarily to recognize seasons, but timing is a little different. Our last foundational scripture, we're really going to park right here greatly, probably for the rest of this sermonic presentation. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. I've never saw this before. I read this story so many times. I never saw this until last week. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. It says, now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. This tripped me out. It's securely shut up. Nobody could go in and nobody could come out. And God's like, see, that's proof is yours. Because with God... Sometimes you enter seasons to where it's not what it looks like. The door is closed, but it's not closed for you. It's not what it looks like. It's shut up, but that doesn't mean it's not yours. It's not what it looks like. This is why we walk by faith and not by sight. I know they're not hiring, but it's not what it looks like. I know they're not accepting everybody, but it's not what it looks like. Because my children live under the law of exception. This means it can happen to everybody except me. <laughs> I don't have time to bother that. Verse 3, you shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. I told my media team, I want us to see these images of just imagine you have to walk around something this big. And it says... And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets, and it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, meaning you're not going to have to fight. You just got to praise for this one. 
and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Ark of the Lord. He said to the people, Proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven tram- trumpets of ram's horn before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard after the ark while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not, or you shall not shout or make any noise. With your voice. Somebody say, shut up. Shut up. Okay. Nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. Our verses of emphasis, the segments of scripture that I would like to bring to your attention and your awareness begins at the beginning of verse 5 in Exodus chapter 9, where the text tells us the Lord appointed a set time. The Lord appointed a set time. Appointed, appointed, a point. Hmm. The root word in a point is point. So the Lord has a point in your life that has been set for you to meet. Appointed. Warren, come here. I want them to see this. It's God saying, there's a point that I have already set. Just hold up the clock for it. Come up here. You can get into the light. So God is saying, I have already set a point for you to meet. Now, here's the part that we don't like to think about because everybody always says it's the timing of God. It's the timing of God. It's the time. Okay, that's not totally incorrect, but it is incomplete. This is the point that God has appointed for you, or let's say it like this. Two o'clock is your appointment. But what you do at six o'clock. Okay. We're going to lose all the amens because we want to put the timing all on God. Okay. You can make decisions at six that cause you to live here 40 years. Let me give you Bible. Y'all can see this. Okay. Ecclesiastic 7 verse 17. Let's put this on the screen so y'all can see this. Ecclesiastic 7 verse 17. It says, do not be overly wicked and do not be a fool why die before your time okay so watch this why die before your point are you getting this you can make choices at nine o'clock to continue to date somebody that is not god's will for your life end up blaming God why this man or this sister y'all been together 14 years and it's the same trauma the same drama the same pain your point has not changed it's just you haven't is this making sense so it's not that we delay the timing of God stop preaching that it's not Bible It's that we are disobedient to God to where we make our trip that was supposed to be 11 days to the promised land. We make it 40 years. Is this making sense? Can I go a little deeper? For anybody who feels like they're waiting, could it be because you are literally doing nothing at each point? So at each point, since you're doing nothing, the weight feels more weighty. But if you were to maximize the use of your time, 
as you're maximizing the use of your time, you will collide with your point. Is this making sense? All right. So if there is a such thing as a appointed time, that must mean by default that there's a such thing as being premature. Okay. If there's a such thing as an appointed time, that must mean there's a such thing as you not being ready or they're not being ready. Because there's a difference between getting ready and being ready. Can we talk? Your arm's good? Can we talk? (laughs) Okay. Getting ready and being ready are not the same. When you are ready, if you give birth right now to what God put on the inside of you, your baby will live. Because you are ready. If you're getting ready, if you give birth to what God put on the inside of you right now, it will die. Because it's underdeveloped or premature. See, the knowledge of trimesters is for us to be aware of timing and development. Conception to 12 weeks, that's first trimester. 13 weeks to 27 weeks, that's the second trimester. 28 weeks to 40 weeks, that's the third trimester. Why do you have that information? So you could know where you are during this development process. This is why comparison, competing, and emulation are so stupid. Especially in the body of Christ. Because you could end up competing, which will cause for you to give birth in your first trimester because you're mentally competing with somebody on social media who's in the third. So now you're experiencing pain because you lost something because you're competing with somebody who's in the third trimester while you're just in the first. There's a such thing as an appointed time. There's a such thing as it's not time, which means there's a difference between no and not yet. (laughs) This is so good, y'all. I hope y'all are getting this. See, it's only the immature that get upset over not yet. If I call Warren and I say, hey, bro, um, remember, I'm supposed to come over today. We're supposed to do that video. And he says, no, Crystal's still asleep. I'm watching the children. Not yet. I will say, okay, cool. Just let me know. Now, if I tell Jay, he's like, daddy, are we going over Uncle Warren's house so I can play with Kai? Not yet. Why are we always saying no? Why? I'm ready to go. It's taking so long. What? Right? Because the immature view the not yet of the father as no. (laughs) This is so good. When you mature, you recognize not yet means it's not two. It's not two o'clock yet. Last thing I want you to see, then I'll give your arms a rest. I want us to fully understand this. The distance between petition and manifestation is obedience and maximizing the use of your time. Please hear me. The distance between petition, that's what you're asking God for, and manifestation, that's when God reveals to you yes or no. The difference, the distance between petition and manifestation is maximizing the use of your time and obedience, which means you can't rush two o'clock. You can't rush your appointment. If you decide to show up early, say you go to your doctor's appointment at 9 p.m., 9 a.m., excuse me, but your appointment's at 2 p.m., what do you look like mad that the doctor hasn't seen you at 12 p.m.? I wonder, is there anybody frustrated with God because he won't squeeze you in? Go ahead, bro. Give your arms a rest. You can sit down. You good. I wonder, is there anybody upset with God because (laughs) he won't squeeze you in before your appointed time? But truthfully, if they try to squeeze you in, they throw all the other appointments off. So your appointment is not just so that you can meet your point. It's also so that everybody else can meet theirs. 
This is why your obedience matters. Because your obedience is tied to a point. And there's some people who are supposed to meet you at a point. But if you're still in rebellion at that point, they're not going to be able to glean from you what they're supposed to glean from you if you got that wisdom when you met that point. That's the first verse that I want to bring to your attention. See, this is the power of exegesis. I don't need to preach 20 different verses. Just break down one. The writer of Ecclesiastics compliments this when he says there is a time for everything and a season for everything under the sun. And then Joshua chapter 6. This is the part that blew my mind. I never saw this. Verse 3. I want us to see this. Verse 3. Joshua chapter 6, verse 3. This low-key messed me up. Y'all probably not going to see it until I break it down. Verse 3, it says, You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around all the city. This you shall do four days. Oh, this is my father. This is what the Bible said? Oh, this is what you shall do three days. Six. Hmm. This is what you shall do six days. Watch this. So their victory was married to a time. So good. This is so good. Their victory was married to obedience and a time. It's almost as if their victory had a contingency clause. You know what a contingency clause is? It's almost like I leave in my will my house for my children. I will my house for you, but you can't get it until you graduate from college. It's a contingency clause, meaning it's yours, Josiah. It's yours, Melody. It's yours, Jared III. But you can't have it until you do my instruction. I already have it for you. I'm going to give it to you. But it's contingent on you following my instructions before you get it. God is saying, okay, this battle has a contingency clause. It's yours. You're going to win. You're going to get it. But it's contingent on you obeying and trusting my timing. Because if they would have shouted on the third day, nothing would have happened. Why? Because it wasn't the right time. If they would have shouted on the fourth day, nothing still would have happened. Why? Because it's not the right time. If they would have attacked Jericho on the fifth day, they would have lost a battle that they are ordained to win. Not because God wasn't with them, not because God wasn't for them, but because they disobeyed his instructions and they disobeyed at the wrong time. The worst combination in the world is disobedience and wrong timing. You want to mess up your life and live in recovery? Live a life of disobedience and wrong time. Wrong time. N nothing would have happened if they would have shouted on the sixth day because it wasn't the right time. So your victory is tied to obedience and a time. Man, I wonder who under the sound of my voice is discouraged because you want victory on the fourth day that's reserved for the seventh. I just wonder. You're mad at God because you want the victory on day two when you're going to get it on day seven. And I couldn't help but wonder. As I was looking at this text, I was like, man, what was it like to be a soldier who got these commands? Like, like, I like to make the Bible come alive. Imagine you're a soldier. You're a fighter. You're a warrior. You've been training for this moment, battling for this moment, been eating like kale, grass, and lettuce, <laughs> getting your body all right, all tight. You're practicing on thrusting your spear, your shield. You're like, oh, like you're ready. <laughs> you go to your captain. You go to your lieutenant. You go to your colonel, and you're like, sir, what are the orders for today? Go in circles. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. March around the city, the whole city, and do this for six days. What's your command? Go in circles. And I, I begin to wonder, I wonder if this text is in the Bible. Because God wants to show us, what do you do when it feels like 
I have you going in circles. What do you do when it feels like you're obeying God, you're trusting God, but you're going in circles? I thought by 2023 I would be here. I thought by this time I would be here. Christmas songs are already playing. I said <laughs> in January 1st that I was going to do this in 2023, this in 2023, but I feel as though God has me going in circles. I really do believe this text is designed to show us one important principle. What do you do when you feel as though God has you going in circles, you shut up and obey? That's what the Bible says, verse 10. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth. Joshua is saying, we're going to shut up and obey. I know you don't like it. Shut up and obey. It doesn't feel good. Shut up and obey. Why are you looking at me like that? I didn't say that. The Bible said it. I'm just talking a story. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. Shut up and obey. And then I begin to dig a little deeper. I believe Joshua learned something. Because you have to remember, these are the people who are the descendants of the same people Moses dealt with. And their fathers kept on complaining a whole lot. All the time in the wilderness, they kept complaining and saying, we want bread and we want water and why didn't we die in Egypt? And they complained so much so where it activated an impulsive behavior in Moses because one of the ways the enemy steals our time is by activating, activating impulsive behavior in you. I want to put people around you who activate your ratchet, who activate your spice. See, nobody cares how good your, your gift is because nobody likes to eat a five-star meal off a trash can lid. I can't get past your attitude, ma'am. I can't get past your ratchetness. I can't get past every time I talk to you, you start popping your neck. I can't get past you grabbing the air. I can't get <laughs> clapping your hands. Y'all don't want to talk to me. It's your attitude. I'm saved, but don't try me. <laughs> try Jesus. <laughs> so I believe Joshua began to take a mental note because you remember Joshua was with Moses. And Joshua saw they got Moses so mad where Moses called them outside of their name. And then he didn't speak to the rock. He hit the rock. And God said, okay, because you did not honor me as holy in the sight of my people, the place that you're leading them to, you're not going to enter it because you didn't honor me. I believe Joshua said, you know what I learned from Moses? Y'all, shut up. Don't say a word. I know it sounds crazy. Shut up. I know it doesn't look good. Shut up. Because you can agitate something in me that I'm trying to keep in the grave. Be careful of friends who try to resurrect what you're trying to bury. Somebody shout, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. you, you shut up and you obey. <laughs> you shut up and you obey. Joshua remembered, hmm, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, the tongue is the paintbrush of the heart. <laughs> the tongue is the paintbrush of the heart. So here's the quintessential question. Who's painting on you? <laughs> Who's painting on your perspective in conversation form? Who's painting on your faith in conversation form? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and the tongue is the paintbrush of the heart. No wonder God had us in voices for 14 weeks, because God was trying to get us to understand a lot of paintbrushes aren't painting what I'm telling them to paint. And you be careful with allowing people to paint on the canvas of your mind, because they will give you a distorted picture. So here's the cheat code. Here's the cheat code. Everybody has a paintbrush, but you don't have to be a canvas for everybody's paint. This is so good, y'all. Everybody has a tongue. Everybody has a mouth. Joshua learned, I'm not going to listen to the comment section. I'm going to put my comments on mute. 
this is way back in Bible times, we still see the power of mutant comments. I need to turn off the comment section because God is telling me to do something that seems a little crazy and I already feel as though it's crazy, but I don't need you to tell me that I look crazy because I already feel like I'm crazy. I'm going to tell all y'all be quiet. So good, y'all. So now as I'm looking at this, I'm like, I get it. I get it. The devil deceives through discussions because he wants to contaminate decisions. He wants to intoxicate the sobriety of our decision-making. Why? Because he wants to steal your time. It's about time. That's what it's about. It's about time. It's about time. It's about time. Why else does the enemy send you distractions? Because he wants you to waste your time on the distraction. Because whatever you focus on, you're paying with your time. It's about time. It's about time. It's about time. The devil never hits what he wants. Please hear me. He never hits what he wants. If he hits your car, it's not because he wants it. He can't drive. (laughs) If he hits your marriage, it's not because he wants your spouse. Sometimes they get on his nerves too. If he hits your job, it's not because he wants to work there. He's doing all of that to see, does all of those things have your faith? So if I hit your transportation, if I hit your relationships, if I hit your money, will that take your faith? He never hits what he wants. He sends distractions because he wants you to waste time. It's about time. It's about time. He sends traps dressed up as opportunities because he hopes that you view that as a promotion from God versus a satanic trap because he's trying to get you to waste time. He has things that sometimes speak doctrine, but then other times speak heresy. Why? To confuse you because confusion is a time waster. This is so powerful, y'all. It's all about time time. I want them to waste their time. If I can get them distracted in time, they'll never be a threat to me while they're in time. So I'm going to try to get them to waste their time. It's the the opposite for the kingdom. Why does God give us wisdom? To protect your time. Why does God give us instruction? So that we can steward our time. Why does God give all of us a purpose? So that we can be fruitful with our time. Are y'all getting this? It's all about timing. I want us to see this text. In Acts chapter 1, verse 7. Acts chapter 1, verse 7. When the disciples rode upon Jesus, and like, okay, good. You the Lord, you resurrected from the grave. Okay, great. Are you about to restore the kingdom now? Look at what Jesus tells them. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set. I love when the Bible compliments. Okay. It's, like, it's not for you to know what time the Father has set by his authority. All you have to do is obey and maximize the use of your time until you run into your point. Every season of your life has a different point, meaning a different appointment. There were people that I was supposed to meet this year. That was a point. There are people you're supposed to meet next year. That's a point. If you waste time, you missed your points. And if you missed your point, eventually you will go to the grave never making a point. This is so good, y'all. <clears throat> you are designed to leave an imprint on the earth. Why are you here? Why do you think everybody's fingerprint is different? So that when you leave the earth, you left an imprint on time while you were in it. So that when you go back for, to the Father and he asks you, what did you do? With the time I gave you, you could say I stewarded the time well and I surrendered my life to the gospel and I won souls with my time. 
I broke this down even further where we can see how fragile time is. There are 8,760 hours in one year. 8,760 hours in one year. Somebody say time. time. Now, the average life expectancy in America, here in America, is 77 years old. That's just the average lifespan. So I did a little math. The average lifespan in America is 77 years old. That means that it's 674,520 hours. Okay? So that's just a rough means of the average lifespan. You got 674,520 hours. If you're 30 years old right now, you've already used 200 262,800 of those hours. Okay? I want you to see how life is like a vapor. I'm still young. Okay, bet. You're 25. All right. You've already used 219,000 of those hours. If you're 50, you... Somebody said, oh, gosh. <laughs> if you're 50... You've already used 438,000 of those hours. All of that math to simply tell you this. Wasted time equals wasted life. Sometimes your phone will tell you, you spent 15% more time this week on your iPad, on your iPhone. Just imagine if you increase your prayer life by 15%. 15%. You come here, service starts at 12. We're usually done about 1.30. That's 5% of your day. 5% of your day can make a 100% difference in your life. I'm trying to get us to view every show every person, every relationship, every conversation, every scroll as a payment. That's what I'm trying to, nothing is wrong with watching TV if during the day you paid attention to stuff that paid you back. But we are entertaining ourselves to death and we're wasting time to where we end up feeling like, what's the point? And God's like, you're not maximizing your time and obedience to get to the points that I have for you. There's an appointment for you in every season of your life. Every season of your life, there is an appointment. So as I'm looking at this, I'm like, man, time doesn't wait for you to discover your calling. This is why Ecclesiastes 12 and 1 says, remember your creator. When? In the days of your youth. Because your time is not waiting for you to obey. It's not waiting for you at all. Life is like a vapor. Here one moment, gone the next. Y'all don't believe me? How in, the world is Chris, how in the world is Thanksgiving Thursday? I feel like I was just preaching Planet four months ago. Josiah, our son, is seven months this week. Like time is shoo, gone. You don't have time to waste time. Can I get us to say this over our life? And everybody watching, could you put this in the room in all caps? Can I get us to say, Father, Father give, me give me the wisdom and obedience, and obedience to, remove to remove anything that's causing for me, causing for to, waste to waste time. No season is wasted. No One more time. We need to decree this over ourselves, y'all. Father, Father, give me the wisdom, me the wisdom and obedience, and obedience to, remove to remove anything. Y'all sway your hand. Remove anything. That's causing for me to waste time. No season is wasted. That's how we have to live. To where no season is wasted. The Lord appointed a set time. Tomorrow I will do this in the land. There is a time for everything. Everything. A season for everything under the heavens. March around the wall. 
for six days, one time a day. And then on the seventh day, you shout. You give me praise. I'm not concerned about the praise part. I think the church has done a great job teaching us how to shout, teaching us how to clap, teaching us how to jump, teaching us how to dance, teaching us how to knuck and buck in pews. And get, I think we've done a wonderful job teaching people how to praise. My concern is the obedient part, though. That, that's, that's my concern. We obey when you don't understand. Obey. You don't like it. Obey. It doesn't feel good. Obey. You're 35 and don't have a prospect, prospect for marriage. Still obey. Keep your legs closed. Trust God's timing. Will you still obey when it's uncomfortable? Y'all see how quiet it's getting? Will you still obey? If I say give God praise, everybody turn. If I start talking about obedience, we get quiet. God said, I want your obedience. Your songs don't impress me. Your dancing, that's great. That doesn't impress me. I want your obedience because if you obey, I will blow your mind. If you obey, I will cause walls to fall. If you obey, I will cause you to enter into seasons where my goodness is so good to you that it will blow your mind. If you obey, I can pour out my favor on your life. If you obey, you can shift from enduring to enjoying. If you obey, I know you're under attack, but you're also under the blood. Will you obey? I'm not preaching trying to be popular. I don't care about a following. The same people who follow will destroy me if I ever have a humanity moment. I understand that people holler, hail Hosanna in the highest, and then a few days later, crucify him. I'm not doing this for the applause of men. I'm doing this out of obedience to God. If I don't preach, I suffer. If I don't preach, my fire is shut up in my bones. If I don't preach, I don't feel like I have a meaning. If I don't preach, I don't feel like I have a purpose because that's what I'm called to do. When you are passionate about what God called you to do and you're obedient, you can care less what people say. Stop listening to people who don't have to deal with the consequence of your disobedience. They don't have to deal with what you're going to have to deal with if I obey. And when God doesn't have your attention, he knows how to disturb what does. And I don't ever want to be in a place where God's trying to get my attention because I'm not obedient. God said, as we end this year, we need to talk about timing because so many sermons have put timing just on me as though timing is not tied to their obedience. It's obedience. This, this pine cone right here, I shared this and planted. This pine cone right here has a forest already on the inside of it. Already, right now, this contains a forest on the inside of it. But the only way you get to that point, the only way you get to that season is it has to go through storms, protection, planting, and time. Trying to give you a revelation. You have something on the inside of you that God has called for you to do. A lot of us, we understand we're going to have storms, but we don't protect our time. I got to guard my peace. How about guard your time? Guard your time. We're going to stay out kind of late. I'm not. I'm leaving at 730. <laughs> I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or something, but naps hit different. <laughs> they hit different. The same things that my parents just say, go to your room and take a nap. I'm like, Lord, if I could go to my room and take a nap. <laughs> okay. You got to have adversity. You have to. Stop counting it strange. You have to have that part. That's not just adversity, that's watering. Remember the sermon, Enjoy the Rain? You need the rain to get to the forest, but you have to protect your time. Then the next phase after you protect your time, you have to be faithful somewhere. I don't get to two if I'm not faithful at six. Is this making sense? I don't get to seven if I wasn't faithful at six. I have to be planted. What is that? God put in me some roots of faithfulness, of endurance, 
I know that you're ready to go out and lift weights for the kingdom, but can you run marathons? I know that you have faith, but how long is it? I, I got great faith. But do you have faith that can last till two? Do you have faith that can wait 25 years, Abraham, until I give you the promise? Do you just have faith or do you have long faith, endurance faith? When you have that, you reach the timing. What I'm tired of seeing, it used to be my favorite show, now it kind of bothers me. I used to love First 48. Now I'm like, man, there are so many people who aren't making a point with their timing because they keep making foolish decisions. And you have a generation that's dying without making a difference. You're here to fix the problem. When you die, the problem should be gone because you fixed it. So I get it. What the devil would do is he would try to use your past or try to get you to fear the future, which will cause for you to be stuck at a certain time. This is why I believe exes come back. I do. Because familiar voices you always entertain when you're in dark places. I want to give you all some points why. Okay, I believe the enemy allows our past, our people from the past to come back, number one, to see, do I still have a grip? Hmm. Is this change sincere? I saw them in church shouting, but can I have them tonight? Do I still have a grip? I saw you praise dancing. I saw it. That's great. I love it. But will you still dance for me on Thursday? I want to know, do I still have a grip? Do I still have a grip? Because callings require farewells. Callings require farewells. But I want to see, do I still have a grip? Number two, do I still have access? It's one thing when you delete the text thread. It's another thing when you block the contact. Okay? It's a greater thing when you get a different number. What do I have to do? Sometimes I got to take some extreme measures, hear me, to make sure that still doesn't have access. That's not mean. That's protecting my time. Number three, I believe sometimes he allows things to come, to the, come back from the past because you're close to something. You're close to two. <laughs> you're close to two, and I want you to leave before your appointment. You're close to something. God sends and counterfeits come in the same season. Same season. At the same time, Adam, serpent, same season. Baal, Elijah, same season. Jesus, Herod, same season. They come at the same time. Number four, I, I want to see, do um, I limit access? Because some people come in your life will actually limit access from you getting to the next level. You ever been with somebody, don't raise your hand, you ever been with somebody who tries to control what you do? Where you going? Who, who you with? Why they there? Who going? What time? Limited access. You don't have to control what loves you. That's a whole word. Number five, why do things come back? Because it misses you and your services. It misses you and your service. Why? Because point number six, you gave them life. Only Jesus could do that. Oh, break it down a little more. Parasites get life off of host. I'm trying. I'm trying. Leeches live off of host. And sometimes they come back because I was living off of you. Hmm. Joshua chapter 5, verse 2. We'll end with these few points, and y'all can have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, protect your time. Uh, <laughs> Joshua chapter 5, verse 2. I saw something that was so interesting. Remember, the walls of Jericho came down in Joshua chapter 6. 
But in Joshua chapter 5, verse 2, it says, At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives. Every brother should feel some type of way right now. <laughs> and circumcise the Israelites. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised. But all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. Brothers, in March when we have our men's conference, I'm really going to deal with this because Joshua had to go back and do what their daddy was supposed to do. The sons are supposed to get circumcised biblically on the eighth day. But Joshua had to go back and help brothers do what their daddy didn't do. And sometimes being a kingdom man, you have to help men become covenant men because the circumcision was covenant. Sometimes I have to help brothers get what they were supposed to get from their father, but they didn't get it. But I have a Joshua spirit. I can help you cut off. I can help you cut off what's hindering you from being in covenant. All circumcision was, was an outward demonstration of an inward covenant. This is why when David went to Goliath, he said, you uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> what is he saying? You fool with no covenant. You trying to come and approach me and I have covenant. Oh, you want all the smoke. He was saying, you don't even have a covenant with God. Are you talking noise like that? Bet. Bet. That's what he's saying. Does this make sense? So when you consider, before they got the victory, they had to be cut. So powerful, y'all. So what is the importance of that? Five points. There's covenant. That's the cutting, cutting away. We now accept Christ. We have circumcision of the heart. So there's covenant, cutting away. Now I'm with Christ. There's instructions, number two. Number three, there's timing. Number four, then that's the miracle. And five, repeat. That's it. The whole life. Our whole life, we're in covenant with God. He's going to constantly cut away stuff. He's going to constantly give us instructions. And as we trust his instructions, we collide with that point, that timing, which is going to lead us to experience the miraculous. And then you just repeat. And we'll end with this. The beauty of all of this is despite of us wasting time, maybe y'all didn't do this, but I'll just speak for me. Despite of us wasting time, God has something called graced time. Graced time. What is that? You made a decision. You made a choice that should cause for you to miss something. But because of my grace, I'm going to let you stay on time. I remember this so vividly. My senior year of college, we were supposed to turn in our graduation application by March the 12th. I missed, I don't know how, I missed the announcement. And when I heard the teacher say, okay, everybody who expects to graduate coming April of this year, you have to, May of this year, you have to turn this in by March the 12th. When I heard her say that, it was March the 15th. So I'm nervous, I'm running all the way to the administration office to see if I could turn in my graduation papers to graduate on time. And they closed at four. I was running. I got there. This girl in front of me was arguing with this lady. This is a true story. I'll never forget it. 
She's arguing with this lady. Uh, I work too hard. I'm supposed to graduate. She said, you're supposed to turn this in by March 12th. Forget that timeline. This is stupid. My whole family going to be here. I send out invitations. She's going in, and I'm back there the whole time. Lord, please. <laughs> Father, please. I was a student pastor at the time. God, I'm talking to your youth. And they just going in for at least five, 10 minutes. She's going in with this girl. This girl is crying and yelling. And she's like, I worked hard all this. And, I, and she said, listen, you have to follow the rules. That's what's wrong with your generation. You don't follow the rules. I'm like, Father, please. <laughs> and so she says, get out of here. She says, ma'am, please, I worked so hard. Give me your paper. She gathered the girl's paper and signed it. So I'm super nervous now. So I walk up to her with my packet. She says, young man, don't say nothing. She snatched the paper, signed it. I said, I ain't going to say nothing. <laughs> Praise God. I'm about to graduate. <laughs> I'm about to graduate. I don't have to say nothing because sometimes God gives you grace time. And that girl didn't even know she was fighting on my behalf. Is anybody thankful for grace? The grace of God. We shouldn't be here, but the grace of God. We shouldn't be staying in the membrane, but the grace of God. We should be dead, but the grace of God. We should be in jail, but the grace of God. We should be in cemeteries, but the grace. Grace. God. So Father, we thank you for your grace. But Lord, we understand that grace is not a permission slip to get by. Now that we've heard this word, we are held accountable. Help us to be protectors of our time. So that one day, when we're out of time, and we can see you face to face, where there's no need for the moon, there's no need for the stars because your glory fills the temple. But everybody desires to hear, it's well done, my good and faithful servant. Help us surrender our lives to you so that that may fall on our precious ears from your sweet lips. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This bless somebody. Yeah. So I just want to do uh, two appeals real quick and then Fred whatever you have to say you can come and say it you are not promised tomorrow all of that math to show those hours are to show you life is a vapor so when we do the plea of salvation it's to secure that I want to make sure that we're not just giving you Bible but not offering you the king so can I get everybody to say this prayer with me? God, God save, me. save me. You told me if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you raised from the grave, I shall be saved. I believe that. I receive that. Now, King, disciple me. Now, King, detox me. Now, Lord, change me so that I won't be the same person I was yesterday on today or tomorrow let my life be a witness of the goodness of God I surrender I quit my way and surrender to yours in Jesus name amen amen yeah If you said that prayer for the first time and you meant it, I want you to text the word fresh start because that's what you just got. Fresh start to the number on the screen behind me. It's the best decision that you've ever made. A video of me will pop up saying, congratulations, you're now in the kingdom. We're all Team Jesus. I want to excite. I'm excited because now you're in the kingdom. 